people of Grandview, it is good to have you with us here on this second Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of love. The Sunday where we reflect on the love of God and the coming of a Christ King and the redemption of all the world. If you're a guest, please know that, uh, well, you're especially welcome, and we are so glad that you are joining us virtually, whether this is your first time or maybe your 111st time. We are so glad to have you with us and hope you find this Advent season a rich and fulfilling one where you can draw nearer to Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are so pleased to welcome you. We've got some wonderful music today. We have wonderful scripture and Gosh, it is just good to be with you on this Advent journey as we journey towards Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Welcome. Mark 1, 4. John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ's way. May the word sent from God through the prophets lead us to the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let's now join in our call to worship. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, all of us have access in one spirit to the Father. Amen. My friends, if you turn now, uh, we will observe our opening prayer. O oh, merciful God, you sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Give us grace, grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, the one who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Old Testament reading this morning comes from Isaiah 40, 1 to 11. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd, and he will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Our gospel reading this morning is from Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the people from the whole of the Jordan countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. People of Grandview, would you join me now in an attitude of prayer? Creator God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, God, are our rock and our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Advent is, well, it's just a wonderful season, isn't it? conjures images for us of snowy winter days and Christmas trees adorned with tinsel and the best goodies fresh from the oven. There is, however, a greater meaning behind the season and one we have almost entirely forgotten. Now, I can already hear someone saying from their couch this morning, of course, Jesus is the reason for the season and Yes, he is, and also, no, he isn't. Advent is one of the longest-running traditions of the church, going back many centuries. In fact, Advent was developed as a season of the church year in the late 4th century. It was practiced across Christian churches worldwide by the 6th Century, So truly, it is one of our longest-running traditions. The church developed Advent primarily to provide an alternate time for final preparation for candidates for baptism. See, the normal three-year preparation period of baptism in the early church included a final 40 days of intense preparation. Of course, a nod to Jesus's 40 days in the wilderness. 
And these 40 days of intense preparation traditionally came during the season of Lent. Baptism would follow then at Easter. But a second season was needed after the Roman emperor Theodosius made Christianity the legal or preferred religion of the Roman Empire in the year 380. Now, not to get too far down this rabbit hole, but it's worth noting that Theodosius was only baptized Christian after most of his life was over. And in fact, it was a brush with death in 380 that then promptly uh, he turns around, not only is baptized himself, but makes Christianity the state preferred religion of the time. Now, at that time, it was approximately 15% of the entire Roman Empire was Christian. But after 380 and his proclamation, the vast majority of the citizens sought to become Christian. So there was this near 85% of the Roman Empire all seeking conversion and baptism all at once. And so a single season could not accommodate all of them preparing for baptism. There just wasn't enough capacity So the Advent season was, in fact, a pragmatic response to the need for volume in the early church. And thus it elevated the importance of the season to a level near that of Lent and Easter. Now don't don't misunderstand me here. This was already the general time when most of the church celebrated Christ's Mass, a.k.a. Christmas. But it was... Considered a single feast day, one day, one special day in the calendar year. And it was not a season akin to Lent until this time in 380. So the intended focus of the Advent season was to be one of reflection of all the things at Christ's second coming, not of things at his birth but instead of the things that are to come when Christ is to return. And by focusing on these last things, baptismal candidates were reminded then of the need for Christ to come again to make all things new as they prepared to begin their new lives in Christ. At this season, baptism would then typically occur at Epiphany, At the end of the Christmas season, when Christians remember the coming of the Magi to celebrate the baptism of Jesus as well. So, it was natural for those candidates preparing that they would then be baptized on Epiphany, and thus the Advent season was born. This is why also, if you see older baptismal fonts, you may note that they include depictions of the Magi bringing gifts, because then Epiphany was not only the Magi coming, but it was also the time for baptismal candidates to be received. So, Pastor Charles, then how in the world did we get from baptismal preparation season to a birthday month for Jesus? Well, I'm glad you asked. Advent was part of the practice of the Church of England when John Wesley was a priest, When he revised the liturgical calendar for use by American Methodists in the year 1784, he kept Advent and its four Sundays. So Advent was part of the Methodist ritual from our very beginnings. However, only eight years later in the 1792 General Conference of the Methodist Council of of, uh, America, The church sought to dramatically shift and simplify almost all ritual within the church, and in fact, removed nearly all of the church calendar and all of the associated readings for each Sunday. So it was really a time of changing liturgical practices heavily within the Methodist tradition. And as a result, Advent became a long, a lost practice amongst most American Methodists for well over a century. Not so true of our European counterparts, but we won't go into that. It wasn't until 1965 that specific ritual resources for Advent were included in the Book of Worship of the Methodist Church, thus attempting to reclaim the roots of the season to their intended purpose. By this time, however, there were other significant developments in the cultural practices of Christmas that really shifted Advent in Methodist congregations. 
See, the Christmas season as a cultural practice was no longer the 12 days beginning with Christmas Eve as it had been. Instead, it had become, well, nearly 30 days from American Thanksgiving to Christmas Eve. This was, by and large, a response to retail and business practices extending and extending the Christmas season in order for them to have a longer selling season at that time of the year. So it was this cultural norm, this cultural bent towards Christmas as a four-week season that sort of overtook the original meaning of Advent. And that meant that even though the 1965 Book of Worship did include readings and prayers focused on the second coming of Christ, many congregations expected Advent to conform to the cultural Christmas focus on the birth of Jesus. This cultural focus continues to overshadow the purpose of this holy time of preparation even today. So the question then becomes, how can we reclaim Advent and hold faithful to the season? Well, I think we can do so by doing what the early Christians did. Now, it's, it's obvious that there is no in-mass conversion that requires us to have a second season of baptismal preparation. No, that's not where we are today. However, the motions and liturgy of the season still offer rich and deep experience for those of us who have already been baptized. The four weeks we celebrate of hope, love, joy, and peace. These are poignant reminders of the faith we continue to walk in. So this week, I want to share some thoughts about love. Now, we all remember the golden rule, right? Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. This is actually a reinstatement of something else that Jesus had said earlier, where he said that the meaning of life is to love God and to love your neighbor as self. Now that's beautiful, but what does he mean exactly by this word, love? See, it's an unclear word in the English language because you can love your mother and you can love pizza. But if the word love means the same thing in both these cases, well, your mom's probably going to feel pretty, pretty badly. So... Then what did Jesus mean in his language when he said love? Well, first of all, this love your neighbor phrase is a quotation from the Hebrew scriptures where the word for love is ahava. However, the language Jesus spoke and taught in day to day was not Hebrew. It was a cousin language of Hebrew. That is, he spoke Aramaic in which the word for love is rachama. But then as Jesus' followers spread his teachings around the world, well, then they translated his words into Greek and used the Greek word agape. Now, we've probably heard of that one. But here's the twist. The earliest followers of Jesus and those who scribed and wrote the books of the New Testament in Greek, see, they didn't learn the meaning of agape by looking it up in a dictionary. No, rather they, they looked to the teachings of Jesus and the story of his life to redefine their very concept of love. So, this one time when Jesus was asked about the most important commandment in the Jewish scriptures, he first quoted from the ancient prayer of the Torah called the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. So, Love for God is the most important thing. But then Jesus, without even taking a breath, quickly follows up by saying another commandment from the Torah, which was the most important, to love your neighbor as yourself. So which is the more, most important then, Jesus, loving God or loving your neighbor? Jesus' answer is yes. See, for Jesus, these are two sides of the same coin. Your love of God will be expressed by your love of neighbor, and vice versa. You cannot do one well without the other. So it makes it clear that for Jesus, agape love is not primarily a feeling, 
for someone else that happens to you like our phrase in English where I say, I fell in love. For Jesus, love is an action. It's a choice that you make to seek the well-being of people other than self. Not the well-being of me, but the well-being of others. Jesus also went on to teach that genuine love for God and others means seeking people's well-being without expecting anything in return. Especially from people who are in difficult situations who have no possibility of repaying you even if they wanted to. According to Jesus, this kind of generous love reflects the very heartbeat of God. But he took this idea and went even further, didn't he? Jesus said that the ultimate standard of authentic love is how well you treat the person you can't stand. Or in his words, you shall love your enemy and do good to them, expecting nothing in return. For Jesus, this kind of enemy-embracing love imitates the very character of God himself. But here's the thing. These are all really, really nice words and good platitudes. And if Jesus had only said them, well, I doubt that some 2,000 years later he would still be relevant in our lives. But the truth is, that's how he actually lived. Much easier to say love our enemy than to actually put that into action. Jesus was constantly helping and serving people around him in very practical and very tangible ways. And he constantly moved towards poor and hurting people who could not benefit him in return. He showed love for the forgotten ones, the ones who fell through the cracks. When Jesus eventually did march into the city of Jerusalem, he made himself an enemy of the leaders of his people by accusing them of hypocrisy and corruption. But then instead of attacking his enemies to overthrow them or seeking out political power so he could overtake them, he allowed them to kill him. And I want to say that again. He allowed them to kill him. He had a choice. They wouldn't have done it had he not been willing. Jesus died for the selfishness and corruption of his enemies. Why? Because he loved them. After Easter morning, Jesus and then later his followers claimed that it was the power of God's love for the world that was revealed in Jesus' life, death, and ultimately his resurrection. As St. Paul put it, God demonstrates his own agape love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, the Messiah died for us. Sound familiar? Or in the words of the Apostle John, God's own agape was revealed when he sent his one and only begotten son into the world so that through him we could have life. And for John, this naturally leads to the final conclusion of his, which is beloved. If that is how God has loved us, then we ought to show love for one another. For God is love. So this Christian faith that we claim involves trusting that at the center of the universe, at the center of all creation, is a being overflowing with love for that creation. This means that the purpose of our human existence is to receive this love that has come to us through Jesus and then give it back out to others. Creating this symbiotic sort of ecosystem of others-focused, self-giving love, that is the New Testament's meaning of agape love. So the question then is how do we respond? <laughs> 
Now, not to oversimplify, but here we go. To respond, we need to find the person that we like the least and do something kind for them. The person you like the least and treat them with kindness. Now, I'm not saying that we all walk around with an arch enemy, a la Superman versus Lex Luthor. No. Perhaps it's the person you like the least simply because you don't know anything about them. Do you know of a family of immigrants? If not, maybe do something kind to help those trying to navigate the immigration system. Do you know someone who's incarcerated? If not, then why not think about how you could support people transitioning out of incarceration back into society? Do you know an addict? Well, then maybe you're being called to support a rehabilitation facility that desperately needs your help. Do you know someone homeless? Someone who's sleeping in their car tonight? If not, perhaps it's your call then to donate to a shelter. Are you friends with someone who is in a marginalized group? Any of them. Take your pick. And if the answer is no, then maybe Jesus is calling you to seek them out. Meet them where they are and care for their needs. Not try to convince them. Not try to change them. Instead, meeting them right where they are and meeting their needs. This week of Advent where we focus on love. Let's not just focus on it internally. Let's do loving things. And let's do them for people who don't deserve them. And for people who have no way of reciprocating. And for people who may not even acknowledge or appreciate you for them. Why? Well, that's because that's what Jesus did. So turn that love around and share it. Because, friends, I hate to break the news to you. We didn't deserve it either. So let's do this love thing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grandview, it is as we typically do at this time. We turn to recognize that, well, we have not turned this love thing around like we ought to. And so we join in our common confession. Will you read with me? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. People of Grandview, hear this amazing news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. My friends, it is now that time in the worship where we Pause and we reflect on the words God has shared with us this morning and reflect on how we want to return our generosity to the generosity that God has shown us. Uh, as always, we have options here at umcgrandview.com where you can make a gift online. And as well as many of you have continued to faithfully send your gifts in through the mail and, and dropping them by the church office I am so thankful in this uh, season of thanksgiving and generosity. I'm especially grateful for you and want to say thank you so much for the faithfulness you've shown the Grandview family. And we are so glad to be worshiping together in this Advent season, even though we're doing it apart from one another. Peace with you.
My friends, it is the first Sunday of the month, and that means it is our tradition here at Grandview that this is the Sunday where we celebrate Holy Communion, the great Thanksgiving. And this one is especially unique because this week is our communion during the Advent season, and so there's a special liturgy written just for this. And so as we begin, I just want to remind you that this table is not the table of me or the table of Grandview United Methodist or even the table of the United Methodist Church. We believe that this table belongs to Jesus Christ. And if you are joining us this morning and you want to be closer to Jesus today than you were yesterday, then this table has been prepared for you. And so whatever elements you might have at home, they may be simple, it could be bread and water or anything, juice, crackers, donuts, anything that you have will be joining in this great Thanksgiving together, and the epiclesis I will offer will be for your elements there at home as you have them also. So please feel free to gather them now, pause if you need to, gather some elements for communion, and join us in the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when the nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be light to all the nations. You scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts and the mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things. The rich you send away empty. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel. Your presence with us, God. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and to death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread gave thanks to you, God broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave, it, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and at home virtually and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world. 
the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, God, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. My friends, the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ poured out for your sin. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to turn to God in prayer, I just want to remind you that um, I appreciate those of you reaching out and, and letting us know what's going on with you. Um, just want to say uh, first that we want to say a special prayer for Debbie this week um, as she is encountering illness and I believe some procedures coming up. And so we want to lift uh, we want to lift them in prayer and just be faithful to um, however we can serve them and be with them during this time. Uh, I know there are other concerns and, and joys out there, and um, I don't want to look over any, but um, as we go to God, let's just focus our hearts and focus our minds on the love that we have in Jesus Christ. Would you join me in prayer? O oh God, in mystery and in silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives and attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit that we may know the joy you give your people through your son Jesus Christ who taught us how to pray by saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now these words of closing benediction. Tell the timid to take heart. The Lord our God will come. Amen.